Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle, I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. I wanted to talk about a recent case out of the Supreme Court that has had a pretty big impact on your privacy rights within your own home. And because I think this is a really important case, I'm going to try to do this as a shorter video. A lot of people don't have time to watch my full length epics, and so there's fewer people who watch those. But I think this is an important topic, and so I'm going to try to keep it short. Let me know in the comments below if you think I sliced it too thin, and if so, I can try to do a follow-up video where I go through things in more detail. Now, this is the case of the Queen and Stairs, and it involves a search happening within the house that's connected to an arrest. So let's have a look. We'll see what's going on here, and I'll explain as we go. So, overview. And this is from the reasons of the majority. So this is the decision that sort of carried the day and became law. So this appeal concerns the permissible scope of a search incident to arrest in a person's home. In particular, the court has been asked to delineate the proper balance under Section 8 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms between an accused privacy interest in their home and valid law enforcement objectives when the police search an accused home incident to their lawful arrest. So a search incident to arrest is basically a set of powers that the police have when they're arresting people. They can conduct certain searches if they can connect it to the arrest. And so they're allowed to look for evidence that might be connected to the offense or to other offenses that they might, you know, properly think you're involved in. They can look for weapons. And I mean, that makes sense when you think about it. You're not going to want to take somebody into the police lockup if they're sitting there with a handgun tucked down the front of their pants. You know, the, the officer loads a guy into the back seat of the police cruiser and he's still armed with a gun. That's a bad scenario. Uh, they're also allowed to search for means of escape. Now, I have never actually seen this come up because, yeah, but it's a theoretical thing that they're allowed to look for, potentially. All right, carrying on here. This case arises in the aftermath of a volatile arrest in the home of the appellant, Matthew Stairs, for domestic violence. The police responded to a 911 caller who reported seeing a man repeatedly hitting a woman in a car. Police officers promptly located the suspect car parked in the driveway of an unknown house. After a quick scan of the car's interior, they knocked on the front door of the house and loudly announced their presence, but no one answered. Now, there's not going to be any issue with them having a look through the car windows, certainly not in this scenario where they've got a report. I mean, that makes sense. They're going to look and see if there's any people in there or, you know, blood or anything else. And, you know, your car windows, which are transparent, and your car is parked sort of on the street or readily available, the privacy interest in that is going to be real low if it exists at all. So upon uh, or fearing for the woman's safety, the police entered the house. Upon announcing their presence, a woman with fresh injuries to her face came up a flight of stairs leading from the basement. Mr. Stairs did not follow. Instead, he ran past the bottom of the staircase and barricaded himself in the basement laundry room, where he was arrested a short time later. After the arrest, the police conducted a visual clearing search of the basement living room area from which Mr. Stairs and the woman had just emerged. The purpose of the search was to ensure that nobody else was present and that there were no hazards or weapons sitting out in the open. During the search, the police saw a clear container and a plastic bag in plain view containing methamphetamine. This resulted in Mr. Stairs being charged with possession for the purpose of trafficking, contrary to, well, the law, and in addition to charges of assault and breach of probation. He was convicted of all charges at trial. Now, after the trial, he appealed his conviction for the drug offense, and only the drug offense, because it's the only one that this issue applies to, on the basis that the drug evidence was improperly admitted. In a split decision, a majority of the Court of Appeal for Ontario upheld the conviction. The dissenting judge would have set aside the conviction and entered an acquittal. So another reason why he'd want to appeal the drug offense is that he's probably looking at more jail time for the drug offense than he is for the assault. And you can decide sort of your own take on, uh, you know, seriousness. Although I don't have a whole lot of details about the assault and what, you know, what details were found because I haven't looked into that in too much detail. So the, another useful thing to note here is that this is a split decision. And that helps because he was able to appeal to the Supreme Court as of right. Normally, uh, the Supreme Court doesn't hear every case, and they don't hear every case that people would like to take to the Supreme Court. 
Uh, many situations you have to apply for leave, so permission to take your case to the Supreme Court. However, in criminal matters, if there's a split decision at the Court of Appeal, then you can appeal to the Supreme Court as of right, which means that you, you have the right to do so. There's no leave application process. So that's, uh, that's why that's important there. So at the Supreme Court level, he argues that the common law standard for search incident to arrest must be modified for searches conducted in a home, given the very high privacy interests that apply to a person's home. He asserts that where the police search for safety purposes, as alleged in his case, they can do so only if they have reasonable grounds to believe, or at least suspect, that there is an imminent threat to public or police safety. And, of course, he says that that's not the tests, or that the police didn't meet that test, rather, and so, therefore, the search was unlawful, and the evidence should be excluded. That's what he's arguing. And, of course, if the evidence in this case is excluded, that being the drugs, then it's going to be very hard to convict him of possession of drugs for the purpose of trafficking. You know, that that's going to result in an acquittal. You know, we want to prove that he had drugs, but we can't actually mention the drugs. That's the end of the case. So, carrying on here. Uh, the baseline common law standard for search incident to arrest requires that the individual searched has been lawfully arrested, and so an example where this comes up is, let's say the police have got a report of a convenience store robbery, but the guy at the, you know, in the convenience store says that somebody walked in and his back was turned and shouted, you know, this is a robbery, I have a gun, and he says, I never turned around because I was afraid, I didn't want him to, you know, I didn't want to see him and make him worried that, you know, I could recognize him later, so I never actually looked at him. I don't know what he looks like. So the police arrive 20 minutes later in response to this 911 call, and they go looking around the neighborhood, and they find a guy who looks suspicious. And, you know, suspicious can mean all sorts of things. But they then go and arrest this guy for the robbery, just based on the, there was a robbery in the area 20 minutes ago, and you look sketchy. That's not going to be a valid arrest. That's going to be an improper arrest, and all of the searching resulting from that arrest is likely to be thrown out. So if they search that guy and it just happens that he's got a whole bunch of meth, they're probably not going to be able to use that against him at a trial. So the next is that the search is truly incidental to the arrest in the sense that it is uh, for a valid law enforcement purpose connected to the arrest. So an example of this is, let's say that somebody, uh, you know, some 97-year-old guy, he's in a wheelchair, he's barely mobile, he's on oxygen, he's, you know, really uh, not sort of a threat in any sense that you can imagine. And, but the police know who he is, and they just run his name just for giggles into, the th into their system, and they see that he's actually got an outstanding warrant from 1982 for a ticket for failure to, uh, for driving without insurance, say. So it's a really old warrant. Um, are we going to be able to find any evidence reasonably connected to the offense? Or any other offense that you suspect him of? Well, no, because there's nothing to say he's doing anything right now, and it's unlikely he's packing around a signed confession about a, you know, a traffic ticket from 1982. Is there any reasonable concern that this guy's got a weapon? Not really. You know, if this guy's got a clean record and he's, you know, fairly ancient? Probably not. Um, do we think that this guy's going to have, you know, means of escape? I don't think so. So at that point, you're talking about this is not really a truly incidental, you know, search here. So, and, you know, the next thing is that the search is conducted reasonably. Well, uh, let's say if we go back to our convenience store robbery example, let's say the convenience store clerk does get a really good view of the guy and says, not only, you know, here's a description, but I personally recognize this guy, here's his name, you know, and he went this way, and I'm pretty sure I can see him in the park right now smoking a cigarette. And the cops go and they find the guy and they're certain, you know, they've got really good grounds to arrest the guy, but the course of their search is that they just, you know, take out a hunting knife and start cutting the guy's clothing off his body injuring him in the process, 
and give them a couple of punches and you know just for good measure and then also take some pictures and post them to facebook you know that would be a really egregious and i don't think i've seen anything that egregious this is a a ridiculous hypothetical but that would be an example of a search not being conducted in a reasonable fashion so all right so they note that the court has adjusted this standard for several different contexts because there's some things that come up which might raise more heightened privacy interests so they talk about the search incident to arrest power has been eliminated for the seizure of bodily samples they can't take your blood incident to arrest for instance and the standard has been modified in other situations presenting a heightened privacy interest in the subject matter of the search such as strip searches penile swabs and cell phone searches now you might think one of these things is not like the other in that list because they eliminated the uh you know that for seizure of bodily samples they can't take a sample of your blood um but they can do a penile swab and i'm pretty sure that if you ask people which thing they would rather have a police officer do um they'd probably prefer that the officer take a blood sample uh, or a breath or saliva or hair sample um, rather than a penile swab however um, if you're wondering why you know why did they split it that particular way well the seizure of bodily samples case happens in 1997 and then the uh, the swab case oh right that's 2016 and there seems to have been a trend in recent years in the supreme court where they're a little more permissive of police stepping on your rights. That's just a difference in the makeup of the Supreme Court, and uh, I think we're all poorer for it. So carrying on here, they say, while we agree with Mr. Stairs that the common law standard should be modified and made stricter to reflect an accused heightened privacy interest in their home, we do not accept the test he proposes. So they want a different test. They say where the area searched is within the arrested person's physical control, the common law standard continues to apply. And that's that really lax standard that I was talking about before. However, where the area is outside their physical control, but it is still sufficiently proximate to the arrest, a search of a home incident to arrest for safety purposes will be valid only if. So let's, you know, talk about that distinction. If the police were to burst in right now through that door and arrest me, um, in terms of within my physical control, they're probably talking about the surface of my desk. They're talking about, you know, my pockets, um, within drawers, stuff that I could reach around me, um, that kind of thing. You know, even, you know, stuff that I could get up and go and get if I wanted to. Uh, whereas when we're talking about stuff outside of my physical control, well, you know, maybe if I go into the next room over, that's outside of my physical control because I can't just reach over and pick up a thing there from, you know. So the heightened standard doesn't apply to around me, only to stuff in other rooms and in other areas. Normally, you know, we would have said get a warrant unless you've got some sort of exigent circumstances to go look. And police are able to look around houses for exigent circumstances reasons all the time. You know, if you pick up your landline and call 911, and then when the operator comes on, you don't say anything, you just hang up. They're probably going to send a car over and they might actually look through, you know, do a walkthrough of your entire house just to see if there's anyone there who's in trouble because of that 911 call. So if you do accidentally call 911, it's really important that you stay on the line and explain that it was an accidental call. And, you know, that probably saves you a door. So just pro tip. All right. So they will say it's valid only if the police have reason to suspect that there is a safety re risk to the police, the accused or the public, which would be addressed by a search. So this is a reasonable suspicion uh, standard, not a reasonable grounds test. So less than would be required to get a warrant. Uh, and the search is conducted in a reasonable manner tailored to the heightened privacy interests in a home. So they're not going to be able to kick in your drywall or, uh, you know, and probably not do things like look in your medicine cabinet because, you know, there's not going to be a, a person hiding 
with a shotgun in your medicine cabinet, unless you got a really big medicine cabinet. So carrying on here, they say, applying the stricter standard to this test, the police, in our view, had reason to suspect that there was a safety risk in the basement living room and that their concerns would be addressed by a quick scan of the room, which was the least intrusive manner of search possible in the circumstances. Now, what was the reason to suspect in those facts? Where do you hear that there was another, like, did the police have anything to say that there was another person in the house? Did they have anything to say that there were weapons there? I didn't hear anything. And that's, you know, those are the, the circumstances that, uh, you know, that, that were detailed in that sort of summary here. So going on here, uh, we're going to have a look at the sort of longer recitation of facts. Uh, the police also learned that Mr. Stairs was a known driver of this vehicle that was reported. And he had cautions for escape risk, family violence, and violence. He was also listed as a high-risk offender. So... Mr. Stairs is noted to be potentially a bad dude in the police uh, databases. That doesn't necessarily mean that he was. It just means that that's what the police had noted in their database. So the police entered. They shouted at everyone in the house to come upstairs with their hands up because everybody was downstairs. And a woman first came up and she had fresh injuries, including markings and swellings around her forehead and eyes, cuts on her cheek and scratches. And they say that she wasn't cooperative, but she was also not combative. And she apparently told the police that, uh, that nothing had happened and that this was not a big deal. That happens a lot in domestic violence cases. So from the top of the stairs, uh, the one officer sees a man who turned out to be Mr. Stairs run past the bottom of the staircase from the right side of the basement to the left side. They briefly made eye contact with him. Mr. Stairs ignored the police commands to come upstairs with his hands up. Instead, he locked himself in the basement laundry room adjacent to the living room from where he and the woman had just emerged. So the living room uh, was where they were originally and they left the living room. Uh, the woman came up the stairs to, to speak to the police. Mr. Stairs, on the other hand, uh, locks himself into this uh, laundry room. And... When we say he locks himself into the laundry room, you know, he is not super courageous about it because let's see what they say here. They say at one point, Mr. Stairs opened the laundry room door, shrieked, and immediately closed the door. Now, I mean, what kind of shriek is this? Is this like a terror shriek? In which case, this is hilarious. Or is this like him just shrieking like some kind of harpy or vulture? Like, is he just opening the door and making some kind of weird noise? Yeah, I I, I don't know. <laughs> and, I mean, I got some sympathy for police officers because they got to deal with that kind of stuff. But the officers have their firearms drawn and the taser drawn. That might have been the reason for the shrieking. So, Officer Brown, uh, eventually he comes out, uh, comes up the stairs and complies with the officer's commands. They handcuff him and search him and they find only a sum of money. Now, I don't know how much money it is because this might raise the question of if they might have thought other stuff was happening because, you know, if it's five bucks, well, lots of people have five bucks. If it's $2,000 in 20s and 10s, then they might have some different notions about that. So Officer Brown also looked around the laundry room to confirm that no one else was there. And that would have been the area that is directly proximate to uh, where Mr. Stairs was. So, fair enough. Uh, and the court has said basically that that would be fine. And this isn't being contested by Mr. Stairs because they don't find anything in the laundry room. Four minutes had passed from when the police knocked on the front door to the arrest. Officer Brown described the situation as fast-moving and dynamic. Because of course he would. So after the arrest, uh, Officer Vanderveld conducted a visual clearing search of the adjoining living room, so where they'd just come out of, which contained a coffee table, a couch, a television, and cabinets. From where he was standing, he could not see what was behind the couch or the television stand, so he walked behind the couch. There he saw a transparent plastic Tupperware container in plain view on the floor. It contained glass-like shards, which he believed to be methamphetamine. He said that the container was about a foot from the couch and that he did not have to move any items to see it. I'm wondering if this might also have something to do with a shrieking noise. Uh, just theorizing. So 
At a pretrial application to exclude evidence, Officer Vanderveld maintained that the purpose of the clearing search was to confirm that no one else was there and that there were no other hazards. When asked whether he was looking for weapons connected to the assault, he said, not, not necessarily connected to the assault, no. You don't want to be in a basement where weapons and firearms are sitting out in the open, though. All right, so... But you'll note that they don't actually indicate that there was any, uh, you know, specific concern about why there would be another person there. There's no sort of detail provided as to why there would be, you know, why they would think another person is there. Is it just a possibility or is there just a, uh, you know... And when the court talks about it, they say these safety concerns made sense in the circumstances. The police were in an unknown basement. They did not know how many people were in the house. They could not see behind the couch when coming down the stairs. And they say, okay, you know, it's objectively reasonable for the police to take a quick visual scan of the basement living room. But the question there is, you know, is there ever a, an actual... You know, does there is there anything that actually raises the the likelihood of another person there, or is it simply just that there is a a possibility? And the problem that we're going to run into going forward is that the police are going to say, "Listen, based on my training, there is always the possibility of some other person." And part of this is because the police are great at being trained into a form of paranoia. They're basically taught that every encounter that they have is a potentially dangerous one. And, you know, they get told a whole lot of these uh, sort of anecdotal uh, instances with these lurid examples of very rare uh, situations. As an example, one that you'll hear police officers talking about being trained on is a situation, and this happened in the States, where a police officer walks up to a car window and there was somebody hiding in the trunk of the vehicle and the person gets out from the trunk and shoots the officer from behind, surprises the officer and is able to, you know, to attack them and kill them. I mean, that's, that's terrible, but it's also really unlikely. It doesn't happen, you know, regularly at all. And in fact, so far as I can tell, it's happened once. It's so now you get police officers who will talk about, you know, that they take steps to ensure that they deal with that possibility. You know, you'll see officers talking about touching the trunk of a car, which they say has two reasons. The first is to make sure that the trunk is actually locked. And the second is to put their fingerprints on the car in case that they, you know, to connect that car to them if they get murdered which is kind of paranoid a little bit. But, um, of course, you know, a lot of modern trunks actually have an interior trunk release, so even if it's fully closed, you know, and you confirm that by pushing on it, doesn't mean somebody couldn't pop out. I'm getting a, a little afield here. So, there's got to be a, you know, a distinction here in terms of, you know, Searching somebody's pockets when you arrest them on the street makes a lot of sense. But when you start talking about searching other rooms for safety purposes, well, if I'm here and the police are arresting me in this room, if there's a shotgun downstairs in the basement, who cares? It's not an imminent threat to the police. It's not going to, you know, get itself out of whatever storage it's in, load itself, and come up the stairs to engage in violence. Shotguns don't do that on their own. Maybe they should be concerned if they hear other people and if they've got some reason to believe that those other people might be dangerous. But absent that, I mean, they shouldn't necessarily, you know, we don't want officers necessarily poking around in our houses. That's the reason why typically police want or need a warrant. And the court talks about that a little bit. They say, given the privacy interests in, in the home, warrantless searches of the home are prima facie unreasonable. And prima facie just means kind of as a starting point. The starting point of our analysis is that a warrantless search of the home is unreasonable. And in the case of Feeney, which they mention, the court held that even if they have a warrant for your arrest, they're not allowed to make an arrest in your home unless they have a specific warrant permitting them to come into your home. 
So, and the parliament uh, later codified that by changing the criminal code to govern situations where police may enter dwelling houses to carry out arrests. Um, you know, a police officer with a warrant for your arrest that doesn't say anything about your house can arrest you on the street and can arrest you in your car, cannot come into your house. It is a, a particularly protected and privileged area of your life. So they note, although people undoubtedly have a pri heightened privacy interest in their homes, searches of the home are nonetheless less intrusive than strip searches and penile swabs, which inevitably impact a person's dignity. Now, I get that it might be less intrusive than a penile swab, but I also think that that penile swab case is ridiculous. Um, I think that that's something that they should have had to get a warrant for, but regardless. Um, and if I cover that one, it'll be on locals rather than YouTube because yeah, you can see, you can gather that the facts of that are things that uh, YouTube would not like. So they say, in our view, while home searches may reveal highly personal and confidential information, they do not invariably infringe dignity and bodily integrity as contemplated in Stillman, Golden, and Saeed. Now, uh, one of the things that people who've suffered a break and enter will talk about is the feeling that this has intruded on the dignity and the sanctity of their lives. That this um, is, they find this to be a very personal and very offensive invasion. Uh, we expect that our homes are to be sacred. And, you know, if you go to a party and they say, listen, the party is in the kitchen and in the living room and the bathroom, and you find that person upstairs in your bedroom, you're probably going to be pretty pissed. That person's probably getting sent home. We do find this to infringe our dignity and our bodily integrity. And, you know, it may reveal things about us that couldn't be revealed by a strip search or by a swab or something along those lines. Um, some of the things that we might leave out might be very personal in very, um, in ways that we don't share with the world at large. So, I mean, I guess it's less intrusive if you, but I think if you actually put to a lot of people, listen, we're going to either do a strip search or we're going to do a house search. I think a certain number of people would actually choose the, uh, would actually choose the strip search over the house search if it came down to it. So, uh, one thing that, and this is kind of important, um, Mr. Stairs wanted a standard of reasonable belief in imminent harm. And this is where the dissent splits from the, uh, the majority. The dissent was, requires some degree of imminence. And the Supreme Court in the majority does not require that imminent standard. They, they leave that out. Now, it seems to me that imminence kind of seems, um, kind of seems relevant in the sense that, uh, you know, if the danger isn't going to happen right away, why wouldn't you be able to wait for a warrant or something else? You know, the police say setting the bar, or the, sorry, the Supreme Court says setting the bar too high will prevent the police from acting promptly, taking immediate steps to address risks to their safety and the safety of others, including innocent uh, bystanders. Uh, and they say an imminence requirement would practically prescribe the search incident to arrest power as it would simply restate the exigency exception. If there were exigent circumstances, the police could act solely on that basis. There'd be no need for the power to search incident to arrest. And I feel like this is a situation where they come so close to the right test and they don't get there. Because if you... Uh, you know, if there's an emergency situation, like you actually think that there might be somebody in the next room with a shotgun, then the police can already go in there under exigent circumstances. And if you don't think that there's a, you know, that there's any likelihood that this is going to be something imminent, then why do they need this power? You know, why couldn't they just go and wait for a warrant or, you know, so... I feel like this is them coming real close to the proper test, which would have been either it's an emergency, you know, either it's something that you got to look into right now or get a warrant. 
Keep in mind the example I gave before where you call 911 and you hang up. That's been found to be sufficient for exigent circumstances to police for police to come and have a look around your house. So now we've reduced this standard to be so low. And I'll just give a little example from a case I ran, and I'm going to be very vague on the details just to not, um, you know, just so that it's not sort of connectable to anybody. But police arrive at an empty house and they they know uh, that the person who they're looking like the person connected to the house they know isn't there. They know, in fact, that that person is somewhere else. But they decide to try the door and let themselves into an unlocked door. And then they go and have a look around this, this house because they say that they were concerned that they needed to sweep the house in case there was somebody dangerous there. Now, that case was thrown out on the basis of, listen, that's unreasonable. But let's say they'd conducted, you know, an arrest. Would that now become a reasonable thing for them to go and have a look around? Just not on the basis that they think that there's anything there, but just maybe. So they talk a little bit about the scope of this. They say, uh, as a general rule, the police cannot use the search incident to arrest power to justify searching every nook and cranny of the house. And so they're, they're saying it should be no more intrusive than is necessary to resolve the police's reasonable suspicion and that they should take detailed notes after searching the uh, a home incident to arrest keeping track of the places the extent etc so and that insufficient notes may lead a trial judge to make adverse uh, findings um, i'm gonna have a whole other video on what i think should be uh, adverse findings for searches but that's a whole other video um, but basically that's just saying that they they have to limit what they're looking around into, you know, if they're looking for people, um, maybe they can look in a closet, but probably not your medicine cabinet, probably not your drawers. But let's say they say they're looking for weapons. They might start saying, okay, well, we're looking in drawers that could be readily opened because if you've got a handgun in a desk drawer, I mean, that could be potentially a danger. So... Yeah, they reject the imminence uh, requirement and just basically say that it's got to be uh, reasonable suspicion. And given that this is an example of where they say reasonable suspicion occurs, um, the test for that is going to be pretty low because they say they've got a reasonable suspicion here. And quite frankly, um, it's really, uh, you know, really suspect. So they, uh, they'll just note here uh, that the dissent, and so they address the dissenting decision. They say, our colleague, Justice Karakatsanis, and I hope I've got that right. It's a, a tough name and apologies to the justice there, but uh, maintains that the police acted on generalized suspicion as opposed to reasonable suspicion. With respect, we disagree. I agree with Justice Karakatsanis. Uh, in assessing whether the conduct of the police was objectively reasonable in the circumstance of this case, we were reminded of the invaluable insight provided by Doherty in Golub that in volatile circumstances where the police must expect the unexpected, it is wrong to ignore the realities of the situations in which police officers must make these decisions. While it is critical that the line between generalized suspicion and reasonable suspicion be maintained, in cases like the present one, we must assiduously avoid using 2020 hindsight as the yardstick against which to measure instantaneous decisions made by the police. But again, the police weren't able to say any reason why they thought there was a person there, only that maybe there could be. Or any reason why they thought that weapons were there, only maybe that they could be. So... You know, that to me is a generalized suspicion. That could apply to just about every search that, that happens or every arrest that happens in a home. All right, so the dissent, and I'm just going to uh, really briefly cover the dissents here. Um, they note a home is not only a shelter, it is a personal refuge and a trove of personal information. And this I agree with 100%. It occupies a unique place in Section 8's protections from unreasonable searches and seizures. Indeed, there is no place on earth where persons can have a greater expectation of privacy. But privacy is not absolute and must sometimes yield to competing law enforcement objectives. 
The question in this case is how to balance the two when police lawfully enter a home without a warrant, make an arrest, and seek to conduct a search incident to that arrest. Does the charter require that special restrictions apply? And they ultimately find that they do, and they say, uh, like my colleagues, I conclude that the common law sets too low a bar for searches incident to arrest inside a home. Privacy demands more. When officers to seek to search a home for safety purposes, as they did here, the appropriate standard is reasonable suspicion of an imminent threat to police or public safety. Applied to this case, I conclude that the searches and seizures were not justified. The police only searched the basement once Mr. Stairs had been handcuffed and the victim had gone upstairs and absent any sign of weapons or other people. The searching officer gave no basis to ground a reasonable suspicion that anybody's safety was at risk following Mr. Stairs' arrest. The search and seizures were therefore unlawful and violated Mr. Stairs' Section 8 rights. I would exclude the evidence under Section 24.2, set aside Mr. Stairs' conviction, and enter an acquittal. So basically, the uh, you know they say, listen, you got him in cuffs. She's already outside that area. You know, what does it matter if there's a weapon there other than that you want to search to potentially charge the guy for having the weapon? Uh, yeah, and I agree with them. I think that, uh, that you know, the, applying the reasonable suspicion standard, they should never have found that this was an example of reasonable suspicion and that there has to be some degree of imminence. You know, if it's not, if you can wait 30 minutes, then that's long enough to get a warrant and you should get the warrant. If you can't wait 30 minutes, then you've got imminence and you should, you know, and then there is a different set of rules that apply. Now, there is one more justice who dissents, and that was Justice Cote. And the reason for the dissent is basically that he agrees with Justice Karakatsanis of the, the rest of that dissent to say, listen, there should have been a reasonable uh, suspicion test, and I don't think the police met it. But Justice Cote would have allowed the evidence in and therefore allowed the conviction to stand on the basis of, listen, um, we hadn't decided this case yet, and so the police um, didn't know yet that that wasn't something that was allowed. Now, I don't like this kind of reasoning. I argued, I think, forcefully against it in when I was at the Supreme Court in the case of the Queen and GTD. And the reason why I said that is that we hold the average person, you know, on, uh, you know, on the street to a standard of you have to know the law. You know, if I am in a self-defense case, if somebody comes up and attacks me with a knife, I'm expected to get the law right because a, an argument of, you know, mistake of law is not going to be held to, to clear myself. So if somebody pulls a knife and they're running at me and they're a hundred meters away and I happen to have a rifle and I shoot them at a hundred meters and I say, listen, I thought that was allowed under the law. I thought the law says once the guy has a knife, I can shoot him and that's cool. Uh, they would say, listen, that's mistake of law. You are wrong and therefore we're going to convict you. But we're, you know, the flip side of that is if we're turning around and saying, listen, the police officer didn't know the law, um, he gets a pass and the evidence comes in. I'm not so sure on, uh, on that one. You're expected to know the law, even in cases where the Supreme Court hasn't figured out what it is yet. Uh, I covered the case of the Queen and Care recently, which you might not have watched because it's super long, but the... <laughs> You know, Mr. Kerr was expected to know exactly what the law was in terms of, you know, whether or not he could carry weapons, even though the justices of the Supreme Court split in terms of a whole bunch of two person, you know, positions. So, yeah, I don't like that reasoning, but I do like that he would have found that it was a charter breach. Anyway, um, I guess that's probably longer than I would have liked it to be, but uh, hopefully still watchable. Let me know if you think I should have sliced this one a little thinner, too. Uh, thank you for watching. I hope that this has been interesting or educational. Uh, my next video is probably going to be a rant on the double standards that we see in this case, in cases like, uh, uh, you know, of entrapment, in various other, and in 
self-defense cases because the the courts aren't applying the same reasoning to analogous situations and that's something that bothers me so i'm probably going to have a little rant about that um so that'll be for next time anyway thank you for watching uh please like this video share it with your friends subscribe if you want to see more content I also want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, Canada's National Fire Association, the CCFR, the Canadian Shooting Sports Association, at the $30 level, Sites and Arms Limited, and Mark Olivier Demour, and at the $20 level, Peter Hilger, Mark, Jane Babe and Luxor, Haywire, Dale Nesbitt, Cameron Johnson, Bruno R., Andrew Elsich, and Rick JD. You can also check out my content on Locals, if that, uh, or supported on Locals, if that's something that appeals to you. Um, thank you for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge. See you next time.